Hello, and welcome to Talking to Thinkers with me, Johnny Lyons. In this episode, I shall be talking to a person who has dedicated their life to helping the homeless and who also happens to be a priest. My guest is Peter McBerry. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hello, Peter. Welcome to Talking to Thinkers. Morning, Johnny. Thank you. Great. Um, Peter, um, if we might start our, our conversation um, it, by you giving us an insight about your, your childhood. I, I know you grew up in the north of Ireland. So can you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Newry um, as a young man? Yeah, uh, Newry was a, a small town. Uh, I lived a very privileged life in Newry. My father was a doctor. And a doctor in a small town had good social status and was financially well, well rewarded. <clears throat> so it, it was a happy time for me. Newry in those days was a bleak unemployment spot in the north of Ireland. So everybody after they left school tended to get out of Newry uh, and move off somewhere to look for, uh, for jobs. So it was a bleak enough place, but I was happy there. Uh, our family were... <clears throat> theoretically Republican. <laughs> we identified with the Republic of Ireland, but we didn't want a united Ireland because the standard of living in the north of Ireland was much better than it was in the Republic back in the 1950s uh, and 60s. So it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was, a, it, it was a happy, it was a happy, a happy place to grow up in. Mm. And um, you went to Christian Butter School originally in Newry. Um, how long yeah, were you? How long were you educated in Yuri under the under the Christian Brothers? I was educated there from about five until twelve, so I was six or seven years with the Christian Brothers there. Don't remember very much about it. Uh, again, it, I have no bad memories of it. Uh, I just remember uh, <laughs> the only thing you could be expelled from the school for was playing soccer. That was my memory of of, of the Christian Brothers in Yuri. Uh, so we played Gaelic and I enjoyed that and yeah it was uh, yeah it was again it was it was a happy time yeah very good I, I, I'm a Christian Brothers boy but actually I think our my school was probably the only Christian Brothers that allowed rugby for some reason I never I never quite understood that uh, it was the great exception um, but then you um, your parents as you say you were kind of middle class your father was uh, was a GP so money wasn't an issue no. um, I imagine <laughs> But they, they then decided to send you to the very prestigious uh, Clongoswood School in the south of Ireland. Um, can you explain what, what, why they did, made that decision? Yeah, it was very simple because my father had been at Clongos oh. uh, previously. My grandfather ran a greengrocer's shop in Newry. And he wanted something better for his, he wanted his children to, uh, to move up the social ladder. So he sent the children to, uh, to Clongos. Uh, they obviously had a good experience there because they decided to send me and my brothers uh, to Clongos in turn. So it, it was a very simple, uh, it was a very simple reason, a very simple decision for him. Okay. So you arrive in Clongos, what, in first year? You, you were there from first year till your leaving cert? Yeah, six years I spent in Clongos, yeah. yeah. Okay. And like, so if we look at it from um, sports, academic and mm -hmm. socially, how, how did you find the place? I enjoyed Clongos. I think if you like sports and you like studying, a uh, boarding school has a lot of advantages. You get plenty of both. Uh, so I enjoyed my six years there, I must say. But I know that some uh, pupils there were very unhappy. There was bullying going on. There was a uh, slagging going on, and uh, some people, some young people there, had a, had a very, very unhappy experience. But my experience was very positive. I enjoyed it, uh, and it actually was a good preparation for the Jesuit noviceship, which I entered after leaving school because. Jesuit noviceship had so many similarities to a boarding school that I was in the in the the system as it were uh, prior to going to the uh, to the Jesuit noviceship, which made it easier for me in the noviceship than perhaps it was for others who are coming from uh, from home and from having been at a day school. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm, did your when did your interest in joining the 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 
the Jesuits start? Was there was it was it your final year? Or? No, I, I had right through the uh, right through my second schooling, uh, second year schooling, second level schooling, I uh, had the thought of becoming a priest. Why? I think I put it down to the fact that my father, who was a doctor in a small town, initially he didn't have any partners or assistants. He was there in his practice with his patients. Uh, and I would remember the phone going in the middle of the night. Uh, my father would get up and he'd go out to see his uh, patients. There was no such thing as uh, having somebody to, to take over nights and give him a break or to take over weekends and give him a break. He was there 24 seven for his patients. So I think I got a sense of service from my father. My mother was very religious. She was actually a Welsh Protestant and she uh, converted to Catholicism in order to marry my father, whom they met in a hospital in England. Because in those days, if a Catholic married a Protestant, they were destined to go to hell for all eternity. So to avoid that fate, my mother became a Catholic and like many converts became more Catholic than the Catholics themselves. So we had family rosary every night, no excuses to miss it. Mass, of course, every Sunday. So I think I got a sense of faith from my mother, a sense of service from my father. So when I was deciding what would I do with my life, I think I wanted it to be a, a life of service to others within some sort of religious context. And becoming a priest back in the 1960s was a very respected and respectable way of doing that. Uh, so, and I joined the Jesuits simply because I was at a Jesuit school. Hmm. If I'd gone to Castle Knock, I might have become a Vincentian, or if I'd stayed in the Christian Brothers in Uri, I might have become a Christian brother. The decision was simple. I knew the Jesuits. I knew what they did. And so when I decided I was going to try the priesthood, uh, joining the Jesuits was, was an, obvious, uh, an obvious choice for me. And, you know, just before we go into the, your, your, you as a novice, did you, did you find school easy? Were you academically... Was it was it was it easy to you, or you, were you a, an average student, or? Uh, no, I would have been considered a bright student. So I enjoyed studying, uh, I enjoyed learning, and my results were were pretty were pretty probably, I'd say above average. So studying was not a problem for me. I enjoyed sports. I played any sports that were coming my way. Uh, so as I say, sports and study are. The, uh, the, the lifeline of a, of a boarding school. And if you enjoy those, uh, your chances of enjoying boarding school are very good. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is you, you had options. You, the priesthood wasn't just the, you, you could have done anything then, if you like. If, if you got a good leaving cert, yeah. you could have gone into another profession. Uh, was, the, was, 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 was that ever uh, appealing to you to do something else? Or was it just had you focused on the priesthood and that you were fairly single-minded about that by the time you did your leaving cert? I was pretty single-minded about it. Now I had other options in the background just in case. Yeah. All my brothers uh, became doctors. My uncle was a doctor in Uri as well as my father. His three children became doctors so medicine was was very much in the family so I decided that whatever I would do it wasn't going to be a doctor. <laughs> It would, I thought of things like dentistry or other professions, and they were sort of a backup. But my mind was set on joining the Jesuits and trying to see if this life was, a, it was what, what I was called to do, basically. Uh, so it was very much single-minded right through school years. But if it didn't work out, I had other options, as I say. Yeah, I could go to university. I could get a degree. I could, I could join one of the professions. In those days, university was restricted uh, pretty well to those who had money, so it was easy to get in. And uh, your options once you left university were pretty good. So yeah, I could have had a good career uh, if I hadn't joined the Jesuits. Okay, actually, just uh, before we go into that, how many how many brothers? Uh, do you have sisters? Where do you fit in the family? I have two, I have two, I have two brothers. They both became doctors. Uh, they're both living in England. They're retired now. Uh, I have one sister who's living up in Uri still. Still see her uh, from time to time. Uh, and she's married there. She's brought up her children. Uh, they, 
her husband was a uh, ran a car garage and petrol station in Uri. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's my that was my uh, that was my family background. Okay. Uh, so you you do your leaving search. You you join the um, Society of Jesus um, mm -hmm. as a novice. Can you give us an insight about what happens then? You know, you go, what what do you do all day as a novice? Well, your day, like boarding school, is very structured. You are told what you're doing every day, every hour of every day. So it was a mixture of religious uh, services. You had uh, meditation, you had mass, you had rosary, uh, plus uh, learning about the Jesuits, understanding the history of the Jesuits, understanding the constitutions of the Jesuits, understanding you know, what you were letting yourself in for if you decided at the end of the noviceship to actually become a Jesuit. So it was very much studying again, as in a boarding school, uh, with a lot of uh, religious practices, particularly teaching people how to pray and meditation for an hour every morning. That was the first duty on the, uh, in, in the day. And so learning to, to pray, learning to uh, develop and strengthen your faith, along with an understanding of the Jesuits, that was the core of the uh, of the experience in the noviceship. It was a two-year noviceship. We are unusual that way. It was a two-year noviceship, but I never questioned that. I was happy there as well. It was just simply an extension of boarding school as far as I could see. Uh, so it was uh, the only thing you never got home. Your parents were allowed to visit you in the noviceship every six months, I think it was. So uh, in those days, it was pretty rigid. Uh, you didn't get home. You didn't get any. You didn't get out. Actually, our noviceship was in a in a home called Emo, which was uh, down in the Midlands. There was a drive of about half a mile or a mile up to the house, so it was surrounded by uh, trees and forestry, and you never got out. <laughs> You got out, you did, you did several experiments, what they called experiments. That means you went out, we went out to the local, uh, uh, the local uh, place where, where homeless people would, 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 uh, would come for a night or for, for a week. In those days, homeless people were predominantly uh, middle-class people with an alcohol problem. They had worked in England maybe all their lives, had either lost their job or had been laid off or retired. They came back to Ireland. They had lost contact with family. They had no friends here. So they tended to wander around the streets uh, and go from town to town. And in most towns, there was uh, uh, what we would today we would call a hostel. But it was a place where they could go. They could get a bed for a few nights. They could get fed. They could get looked after. Uh, and the homeless people at that time were, were very highly respected. They weren't uh, looked down upon. Uh, they were, the term that was used was they were the knights of the road. K-N-I-G-H-T-S. The knights who wandered the roads going from town to town. Uh, so we went there for, uh, for four or six weeks as part of our training as a novice. Uh, but that was the only time you were ever allowed out of the, uh, the grounds of the noviceship. It was very, very enclosed and very, very uh, disciplined and very, very structured. And do you, in that kind of setting, um, are, is friendship very important with the other novices or, or were you, are you quite a solitary person or how important is friendship to you? Uh, well, I am quite a solitary person, but you did make friends. Clearly, you're living with people for two years. You do, uh, you, you do make friends. Uh, then those friendships can get broken because after the noviceship, you may be split up. You go to one house, somebody goes to another house. Uh, so it was hard to sustain long-term friendships uh, in an organization where people are constantly moving around. But uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, you, did, you did form friendships with the people uh, that you were uh, living with for two years. And uh, as you came to the end of that, of your noviceship, did, um, did you have a clear idea of how you wanted to be a Jesuit priest? 
Uh, yeah, at that time I did. It changed very, <laughs> changed very much over the years. But at that time, I saw myself as a teacher, hmm. teaching. In, we had five five schools. Uh, they, there were a lot of Jesuits teaching in those schools. Maybe ten or twelve Jesuits at any one time teaching in one of those schools. Uh, and that was my experience of the Jesuits in Clongos. There were people who were there, they were teachers. So when I joined the Jesuits, I, I suppose I expected that I was going to end up teaching in one of the Jesuit schools. And I chose to do science because there were very few Jesuits who were teaching science. It was uh, most Jesuits were doing sort of arts or uh, classical studies or uh, so I opted to do science. I was good at science in school, so it was a natural enough choice. So I opted to do science as, with a view to uh, teaching science in, uh, in a secondary school after I had uh, completed the studies with the, with the Jesuits. Now that changed over mm. time. Uh, I did teach for two years. I taught in Belvedere College, which is a fee paying school in the middle of the inner city uh, <clears throat> for two years. And I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed the actual communication of ideas and communication of information to students. But to be a teacher, you also have to be a circus trainer and you have to be a crowd controller and a whole lot of other things, <laughs> which I didn't enjoy. I enjoyed imparting information and knowledge, but uh, I, I don't think I was much good at, uh, at, controlling, at controlling classes. So yeah. that was my... Uh, but actually, that was a very important two years for me because at the back of Belvedere College, there was a block of flats called Hardwick Street Flats. And I knew somebody who was working in a youth club for the Hardwick Street Flats. And he invited me up one night to, uh, to the youth club. So I went up and I saw what was happening in the youth club. It was a traditional youth club in those days with table tennis and billiards and uh, quizzes and all that sort of thing. So I enjoyed that. Uh, and I ended up working in the youth club maybe five or six nights a week. I was running football teams with the kids in Hardwick Street Flats. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, the kids in the Hardwick Street Flats were very different from the kids in Belvedere College. I mean, if you annoyed them, they just told you to F off. <laughs> No pupil in Belvedere College would ever tell a teacher to F off. They'd be sacked straight away, expelled straight away. Um, so as I said, they wore different masks, yes. but they were very they were very direct. They were and I enjoyed that. So later on, when the opportunity came to go to the inner city, I had enjoyed working in Hardwick Street Flats, which is in the inner city. And so I volunteered to uh, to, to go and work and live in the inner city for a few years. OK, that's the bit, actually, I'm not clear about your your your, your kind of story, really, uh, because you're you OK, you, you talked about you were in the youth club, you were still teaching in uh, science in um, in the school there in, in Belvedere. How did you go from there to living in Summerhill? Well, say I, I did two years there working in the youth club. Then I went to study philosophy and theology in Milltown Park on the south side. Okay. Uh, I was there for, I think, four years, but I was back many evenings uh, and many weekends with the kids in the youth club, uh, either work, running the youth club at nighttime or working with football teams, taking football teams at the weekends. So I kept up that contact during my four years of uh, philosophy and theology. And then in 1972, wasn't it? Uh, in 1974, um, the Jesuits decided we wanted to get involved in, we wanted to get more involved in justice issues. We were not associated, we were not uh, uh, considered to be very involved in justice issues. And justice was becoming a, a major social issue uh, at that time. It was coming from Latin America, liberation theology was flourishing, and that was uh, was coming all across the, the Atlantic to, to Europe. And so we decided we wanted to get involved in some sort of justice issue. And the first thing to do was to go and live in a poor deprived area. So the Jesuits asked uh, the Dublin City Council for a flat in the inner city where we could go and live and work 
and they offered us a flat in Summerhill. Summerhill was a, a street, it was part, right in the heart of the inner city, and it was extraordinarily deprived. The housing was appalling. Much of the housing was old tenement houses that we associate with the 1800s or early 1900s. The houses were often divided into eight flats, each flat for a family. There was one outside toilet for the eight families. There was no soundproofing between flats. So the flat we were in, we could hear the news on the television in the flat below perfectly clearly. So uh, it, was, it was pretty awful. The unemployment was high. In the inner city, most people traditionally had worked on the docks, loading and unloading ships. And then when containerization came in and the cranes did it all, people lost their jobs. They weren't trained to do anything else. So the unemployment rate back in the 70s in the inner city was maybe 75, 80%. So young people growing up in the inner city had no expectation of ever getting a job, never mind a decent job. And so if you have no expectation of ever getting a job, what's the point in staying on in school? So the young people there were leaving school at the very latest by the age of 12. They were hanging around the streets all day long. Parents were often unemployed, couldn't give them any money. So what were they doing? A little bit of robbing. And by the time they got to 16 and 17, they were doing a lot of robbing and they were going to jail. So that was the area that we uh, moved into. We very quickly uh, discovered that was the key issue. It wasn't homelessness. Homelessness was a small problem at that time. The problem was these young people leaving school early and hanging around the streets. Uh, so we opened a youth club for the kids in the area called the Summerhill Youth Club. We opened a craft center. They could make lovely crafts and they were able to sell them and make a few bob uh, legitimately. Uh, we were able to employ some of the young people making the crafts and we'd sell them to the shops in town to pay their wages. So that was how we began there. We I did that for about three or four years uh, uh, because that was the, the issue at the time. Then I coming? came across a nine-year-old kid sleeping on the street. Oh, yeah. So we decided, look, we had a youth club for the young people in the area. We had a craft centre. We had employment schemes. Let's get a house and open a little hostel. So we did. We got a house. We opened a little hostel for boys up to the age of 16. Why boys? Because there were no girls on the streets hardly back in the 1970s. That only came later. And the hostel was for boys up to the age of 16 because uh, the health board at that time only had responsibility for children up to the age of 16. Uh, after 16, they were in no man's land. So we opened that hostel for, uh, for six boys up to the age of 16. I ran that for a couple of years. I thought no more of it. This was just like the youth club and the craft center was just another service for some of the young people in the area. But I ran that for a couple of years and then the young people were leaving that at 16, 16 and a half. And they were going back on the streets because there was nothing else for them. So at that time, then 1980, they had demolished the whole inner city because the housing was so awful. And they had demolished our flat. So Dublin City Council had to rehouse us. So uh, we opted to be rehoused in Ballymun. So I was living then in Ballymun. So I asked Dublin City Council for a flat in Ballymun to use as a hostel for the young people who were leaving at 16, 16 and a half. And to my surprise and to their regret ever since, they gave it to me. <laughs> So we had a flat now, we could take the young people after, when they left the, uh, the first hostel, we could move them into the flat. The numbers grew and grew and grew and grew. Eventually we had up to 15 young people sleeping in a three bedroom flat. One night I counted 19, I don't know where they all were. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so the numbers grew, so we had to get another house and divide them up. Uh, and then the Child Care Act came in and we had to separate out the under 18s from the over 18s. So we had to get another house. And then the drug problem hit Dublin and we had 14, 15 year olds coming to us injecting heroin. So we had to open a detox center. And then we had to open an aftercare drug free house for those who had finished the detox. So one thing just led to another. There was no big plan. There was no strategic uh, uh, plan, or uh, there was. Uh, we just we just went from year to year, and I said, "Look, what's the need? God, we need to do something about this problem." And so we opened another hostel, 
uh, we opened a detox center or whatever it was. We just we just went from year to year. So from that uh, nine year old kid sleeping on the street, uh, who's still living with us, by the way, he has a lovely apartment from us. Uh, from that kid, we now have, at the moment of 25 hostels, we have a thousand homeless people every night staying with us. We have about 600 apartments where we can offer a homeless person the key of the door and say, this is yours for the rest of your life. You never, ever have to be homeless again. We have four drug treatment centers uh, and we have a drop-in center. And that all happened, most of it by chance, uh, uh, from a nine-year-old kid. Now, about 15 years ago, the organization was getting too big for me. I didn't have the skills or the interest in running a big organization and in all the administration that that uh, involves. And anyway, I was getting old and uh, I was, everything revolved around me. So if I had died 15 years ago, the whole thing would have collapsed. So decided, right, we'd better make this as independent of me as possible so that it can continue into the future. So we employed a CEO, a terrific person, uh, who has managed to expand this organization enormously and does all the, uh, the administration and uh, financial recording. It does it all absolutely perfectly. So we were very lucky to get him. Uh, he brought in an administration team then. Uh, <clears throat> You know, things have got so bureaucratic, we have to have financial accounting, <laughs> we have to have a human resources team, uh, we have to be compliant with the charities regulator, we have to be compliant with the Companies Act. There's a huge amount of administration now involved in, in the organization. I'm glad I have nothing, nothing to do with that anymore. So my role for the last uh, maybe 10 years or more uh, is working directly with homeless people. I just meet homeless people, they come to me, I go to them, uh, help them discuss, uh, advise, maybe try and help them with any issues they may have. So my role now is direct face-to-face -face contact with homeless people. That's what I really want to do. That's what I've always wanted to do. Uh, so it's been very, uh, I've been very lucky, yeah. Wow. That that was um, a whistle top tour of of the last thirty five years, and uh, it's a fascinating story, uh, Peter, and one that uh, is so inspiring. Um, but if we can rewind a bit now and, and take that a bit slower, because I'm interested okay. in this in the story of how you how you got into this, um, which that story touches on but doesn't go deeply into it. So. Uh, because I, uh, one of the big questions I have um, about you is why you got into this and why you stuck with it, because a lot of people don't do that. Most people don't. And um, and you mentioned there, you know, your your first kind of contact with kids that were underprivileged was in the was in the youth centre while you were teaching in, in Belvedere. And it, that gave you a, a very different picture of very different types of kids. Uh, as you say, talked very much more directly to you and told you to F off if they felt like it. And, and you weren't going to get that from the kids in, in uh, Belvedere College. So that it was a, a lot of people would have been shocked by that and would have just walked away and said, those kids are so-and-sos, I'm not bothering with that. You didn't do that. You actually found this um, a gripping world that you wanted to be part of how do you explain that? How do you explain the fact that you did that? Because a lot of priests, Jesuit priests don't do that. And they're probably happy you're doing that work. And they, they're probably happy they're doing their work, which is probably, you know, probably more comfortable and not in any way diminishing what they do. But you're really at the coalface in, in poverty. So how do you explain how you did that rather than, and not, not, rather than not doing it? Uh, I don't know, actually. I just enjoyed doing it. Uh, you build relationships, as I say again, in the youth club, and particularly when you're running football teams, you build very close relationships with the uh, with the young people on the on the football teams. Uh, so I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed working with young people. I enjoyed teaching in Belvedere College. Uh, so I enjoyed working with young people, and it just sort of came naturally to me to uh, to 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 continue doing that. And as I say, after I left Belvedere and went to study philosophy and theology, I kept going back to the youth club 
uh, it just, uh, I don't know what it was. I just, uh, I enjoyed it. I think anybody who does get involved in work like that, um, after a while, it becomes, uh, uh, they become committed to it. Uh, you couldn't but be committed to it. Here were kids who had very little opportunity in life. Here were kids who were, uh, had very little interest often in school uh, compared to the kids in Belvedere. So you just felt, look, I can make a contribution. I can try and help. Uh, and I, I was happy to do that. So there was no big, uh, there was no big uh, decision to be made or no big commitment. I just went from week to week and month to month and year to year. And it, it evolved. Now people would say, I would say it was providential. I would say God was leading me in that direction and to the work that I'm doing now. Other people would say, well, it was just, uh, it was just coincidences uh, that uh, brought you to, to where I am now. Okay, that's interesting because, um, so did your faith in God get strengthened or, or change uh, significantly as a result of getting more into uh, working with the homeless? Yeah, my faith changed very much so. Uh, suppose when I was in the novitiate and in the early years in the Jesuits, I was a pretty pious sort of young fella. <laughs> uh, you know, it was religious observances were important, religious services were very important, uh, and they dominated, uh, they were central to, to my faith. When I went particularly to the inner city to, to live and to work, uh, I began to question all that. Uh, first of all, I saw just how I grew up in a very comfortable home, financially secure, had a good education. And then I started encountering young people whose lives were totally different. Uh, I thought Ireland was a wonderful place to grow up in and to work in and to live. And when I encountered the young people, particularly in the inner city, I came to realize that for some people, Ireland is a lousy place to live in and to grow up in uh, and to be unemployed in. So I began to question uh, what I uh, began to question society and what society was doing. And I came to see how divided society is, how some people thrive and automatically simply go on to live uh, live financially uh, secure lives, while other people are just, it's impossible for them. So I began to question our society and then I began to question my faith uh, in the sense that uh, these young people, uh, it wasn't so much bringing God to these young people, but it was bringing them to a sense of their own value. Many young people in that area feel undervalued. They feel they're, they're considered to be of little or no value. They are uh, excluded, they're marginalized, and that affects your self-worth, your sense of your own self-worth. So, so our job was to give these young people a sense of their own value uh, and a sense of their own lovableness because uh, if you don't have much self-worth, you don't have much self-love. Uh, you don't feel you're really of any of, of any um, particular. You don't feel that you have that you are worthy of of being loved by other people. And that was their experience: experience living in a marginalized community, experience of uh, of of having all the doors to a to a future closed in your face. Uh, so it was about bringing young people to a sense of their own value and their own lovableness. And as I always said, you know, you can't believe in a God who loves you unless you first of all love yourself. And if you don't love yourself and you feel that nobody loves you and nobody cares about you, nobody gives a damn about you, how can you possibly come to believe in a God who loves you? So it was about, uh, so it began to challenge my faith. And I began to see that, you know, uh, everybody is a child of God. Everybody has the same dignity as a child of God. And these young people in the inner city uh, were not being given the, the opportunity that other young people were. And that was a denial of, uh, 
of the equality of all young people, of all people before God. So I began to become more radical. I, uh, my view of God uh, moved away from simply uh, religious exercises to, uh, to, to working actively uh, on behalf of these, of these young people. And that's what I believe God would have wanted. Uh, so I couldn't just go and say mass and meditate and ignore the plight of the uh, young people that I was involved with in the university. I had to do something to, to change it. So it challenged my values, uh, very much so. Uh, it challenged my, <clears throat> it challenged my prejudices. I mean, for, I can understand uh, why these young people take drugs, for example. Yeah, I can understand. If I was in their shoes, I'd be taking drugs. Drugs were, uh, heroin came into the inner city in the late 80s. And I would say for these young people in the inner city, life was pretty meaningless. Life had no, had, had, there was no prospect of a proper life uh, as adults, a fulfilling life as adults. So heroin came in. Heroin, using heroin, which was the first drug we came across, uh, uh, using heroin was a way of escaping from the reality of life, a way of escaping from the miserable existence that many young people uh, had to put up with in the inner city. And they thought this was the best thing that had ever been invented. It lifted them out of that existence for maybe two or three hours at a time. Now, at that time, nobody knew how addictive heroin was, and nobody knew the health consequences like HIV AIDS or, uh, or hepatitis C. Uh, so it was just a wonderful escape route uh, out, of, out of life uh, for, for them. So, and most homeless people now who do take drugs, but they're in a minority, most homeless people don't take drugs, but the ones who do take drugs are using it generally to escape to escape from something, very often to escape from traumas in their childhood, maybe sexual abuse in childhood, or violence, or extreme neglect. Uh, they're using it to, because they cannot cope with those experiences and those memories. Uh, and so they use a drug to lift them out of it uh, for as long as they, the drug has, has, its, has its effect. Uh, so I came to understand why young people take drugs. I came not to judge young people, because I always say if I had grown up in their circumstances, I'd be taking drugs. I would be exactly the same as them. So they challenged some of my prejudices, uh, that these were bad young people uh, who were only interested in pleasure and, and using drugs uh, to, to get enjoyment. It challenged those prejudices for me, and I came to realize that for, for, for them, using drugs was a very serious uh, and the only a very serious issue, and the only way they could cope uh, with uh, with with their their memories. So I came to uh, yeah, they they it challenged me in so many ways, and I came to be grateful. I, I look back at my life and I realize just how lucky I had been growing up in a good family, good education, good health, good opportunities in life. I realized just how lucky I had been. And so listening to homeless people, I really came to realize that everything I have been given, as I say, good family, good health, good opportunities and so forth, everything I had been given was given to me as a free gift. I didn't do anything to earn it. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I didn't choose to be born into the family that I was born into. It was just handed to me as a free gift. And once I realized that everything I have been given has been given to me as a free gift, I can't judge anybody because when I judge somebody, what I'm actually saying is I'm a better person than you are. But once I realize everything I have been given as free gift, I can't say I'm a better person than anybody else. All I can say is I've got nicer gifts than some other people have got. Maybe I've got more gifts or better gifts than other people have got. That's all I can say. I can't judge anybody. So I think the first thing that, that I changed in me was uh, the, 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 the inability to judge other people. And you can't do this work with homeless people unless you are non-judgmental. If you're judging homeless people and you have these prejudices 
that, that, that homeless people are somehow uh, uh, somehow uh, you know less desirable than the rest of us if you have these prejudices you can't work with homeless people so the first thing that had to happen was to become non-judgmental and it, the only way of doing that was through direct contact uh, with these young people and uh, you know discovering how wonderful they are actually uh, Society doesn't see that. Society just sees some of them robbing and some of them taking drugs and some of them going to jail. But to see how, how, how wonderful many of them are and how compassionate and caring many of them are, you know, they would give a homeless person, would give another homeless person their last cigarette. Many of them would do that. They, they look out for each other very often. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they, it, it challenges it challenges so much of what I had come to, what I had believed growing up as a, a middle class person. And did it challenge? Did it did it lead to conflict with, with well with, with with the Society of Jesus or more generally with the Church? You said you became more radical. Um, the reason I'm asking that is yeah. because for me growing up, I grew up in you know 70s 80s Ireland. For me, the Church was a judger. Have you got me? It judged whether I was good or bad for various sins I may have or may have committed or didn't commit. Um, so the church I saw as the judger, and if I look at society's relation to poverty, that the big the big sin there was apathy. Uh, so it was apathy on one side and judgment on the other. Um, is that how you see the world? And if it is, or if you see it differently, how, did it lead to conflict anywhere with your church? Let's start with that one. No, it didn't. It didn't in any way. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Many or some church people and some Jesuits would disagree with what I say. Um, they don't disagree with what I do. I think they're very happy that uh, I'm doing the work that I'm doing. I think for many people, their attitude is, we're delighted you're doing it and it's not us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, I've never been in conflict with the, uh, with the, with the church or with the, uh, the Jesuits. In fact, uh, the Archbishop of Dublin will send us a small donation every Christmas. Uh, Jesuit superiors wouldn't have left me in this in this role if they were unhappy with uh, with what I was doing. So no, there was never any conflict. Uh, but it did, uh, yeah, it did challenge that sense that the church as a judge, it, the church as laying down laws. That was what I grew up with. The church had laid down all these laws. And your relationship with God depended on how you observe those laws. Mm. And if you observe them, you would be rewarded with a place in heaven. And if you didn't observe them, you may be condemned to a hell for all eternity. That's the, uh, so it was all about obeying laws. And now I totally reject that, that concept of God. Uh, it's not about, I've met these kids, these kids, some of them, some of them, only some of them, they're taking drugs, they're robbing, they're going to jail, uh, but they're wonderful kids. They're wonderful kids. Uh, so, the uh, for me, it wasn't about uh, it wasn't about observing laws. It was about making this world a better place for everyone, uh, and that's what the church's role should be. Uh, I mean, I've said it uh, several times. I mean, if I was a bishop in a diocese, the first thing I would do is ensure that no traveler was living on the side of the road in my diocese. And I would move heaven and earth with the local authorities and everybody else and engaging the, uh, the, the community to accept the fact that no traveler should be living on the side of the road. And the second thing I do would be to ensure that there was a domestic refuge for any women who were fleeing from domestic violence because many of them flee domestic violence but are forced to return home because there's nowhere for them to, to go. So for me, those sort of issues became what God is interested in, not whether I'm obeying laws or whether I have uh, bad thoughts in my head or not. Uh, that's what God is interested in, making this world a better place for, for, for everyone. And so that changed my whole reading of the gospel. I read the gospel as it was Jesus was giving, laying down the rules by which we ought to live. And as I say, if we obeyed those rules, all was good. If we didn't, uh, all was bad. Now I read the gospels as Jesus telling the early Christian community how they are to live 
in order to be the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, and so the early Christian community, it was a community of radical equality. It was a community where everybody shared. It was a community which reached out and uh, tried to meet the needs of everybody within that community. Nobody was to be marginalized. Nobody was to be treated as second class citizens. Nobody's needs were to be left on, uh, uh, on, on net. It was a community of radical inclusiveness and radical uh, solidarity. And for me, that's what Jesus was about. Building that community in his time and we, the Christian community, we are the continuation of that community. So our role as Christians is to build that radical solidarity. There should be nobody in poverty. There should be no, uh, uh, nobody going to bed hungry at night. Nobody going, no child going to school hungry in the morning. There should be nobody homeless. Uh, it's building that community, a radical community where everybody rallies around to make sure that everybody's needs are met. Uh, so, as I, uh, you know, I always say that, you know, the gospel is good news. What is the good news that Jesus came to bring to the poor? That's what it says. Good news to the poor. We often leave out the words to the poor. <laughs> the gospel is good news, but it's good news to the poor. And what is that good news? What's the good news of the gospel that I have to bring to homeless people? The good news I would like to bring, but I can't yet is to be able to say to homeless people, look, I have good news for you. Your homelessness is over. There is a community, it's called the Christian community. They follow the teachings of Jesus and they're going to include you in their community and they're going to share their resources and everything else to ensure that you will no longer be homeless. Uh, that's the good news that I ought to be able to bring to homeless people, but I can't because I think we as Christian communities we have uh, failed, we have failed uh, the gospel, we have failed Jesus, uh, we have compromised, we have, uh, we have interpreted uh, what Jesus was about uh, to suit our own comfort zones. It's interesting though, isn't it? I mean, there are certain problems in the world that, you know, we can solve, uh, but there are definite problems, there are big problems that we, we can solve and, and poverty and homelessness are problems that can be solved if we really want to. Um, there's, you know, there's money that could be a, a portion to this. It's, you know, it has a cost and it could be dealt with. Um, but it's not I just think, money; it's a mindset. Uh, and the mindset, the mindset but the mind, the mindset creates that at whatever cost. Commits to doing this at whatever cost. That's yes. the mindset that we have to change. And of course the church's job is changing mindsets. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And then of course there is money involved, but we, we've loads of money. Uh, I mean, yeah. but it's uh, it's so unevenly distributed. Something that strikes me about your story, uh, Peter is, you know, and we, we go back to this, you know, you were in, you were in Belvedere you were teaching probably mainly middle-class children, it was a fee-paying school, and yet you go to this youth hostel, and that seems to me to be in a kind of a turning point. And it just strikes me that if, if, and it changed your life, because now you saw a whole new community that you were getting a lot of pleasure from working with. Uh, it was giving you an insight into lives that you hadn't seen before. And yet most people, we all live in bubbles. There's a middle class bubble and there's a working class bubble and there's a homelessness bubble and they very rarely come into touch. You're, you came into touch and I often think that if more people actually had that experience, uh, they may end up, you know, changing their way of how they look at people. But most of us don't. We, we live in bubbles and we don't do that. Um, have we you do. ever thought I mean, about that? Yeah, we, we do. Uh... Uh, when I went to the inner city first, two things shocked me. One was the conditions that people had to live in. But the second thing that shocked me even more was that I had lived in Dublin for the previous 15 years. I had taught in Belvedere, which was only a five minute walk from Summer Hill. And I had, I had passed through Summer Hill many times in John McDermott Street. I had no idea that people lived in such appalling conditions. And that's what shocked me more, living in close proximity to people who were living in appalling conditions without even realizing it. 
So I think you're right. And now I say to people, you know, you can, how do you, uh, how do you change? You can watch documentaries on homelessness. You can listen to talks on homelessness. But the only way you're really going to change your attitude to homeless people is by encountering homeless people. So I say, go up and talk to some homeless. Just go up for two minutes. Say, hello, how are you? Uh, what's your name? Maybe if that same homeless person is sitting there day after day after day, maybe talk to build up a little bit of a relationship. It's in encountering people that uh, we change our attitudes. Mm. And so, yeah, we all live in a bubble. Uh, I think we need to burst that bubble. Uh, so I think we need to, uh, we need to go, to leave our comfort zones and try and go out and uh, meet people from a different bubble. Uh, and that changes our mindsets, and that changes the way we think, and that changes, challenges our prejudices uh, and challenges our values. Hmm. Um, another thing I thought that was very interesting you mentioned there, you know, you, you say when, when you, you know, when you started off getting into and helping homeless people and working with them and you, you said that, you know, they were kind of came from loveless backgrounds and the most important thing was to make the, help them make feel them feel valued as a person, uh, which might have been the first time that that had happened. And one of the ways you, you certainly don't do that is ramming down the Ten Commandments and judging them. Um, so how, how did you go about showing these people? How do you go about showing these people that they are lovable? And how do they react to that? I mean, how does that dynamic work? Yeah, well, first of all, they, they, uh, we, deal, we deal primarily with a subset of homeless people who are in that situation that you have described. But the majority of homeless people are. The majority of okay. homeless people came from good homes. They have lost their private rented accommodation because the landlord says they're selling their home, the house, or because the rent has gone to a level they can't afford. So the majority of homeless people today don't have that, uh, don't have that issue. The majority of homeless people today have only got one issue. They don't have enough money to be able to go out and get alternative accommodation once they lose their uh, the accommodation that they're in. So we're dealing with a particular subset, and they are a subset who have come from very disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, have experienced a lot of trauma in childhood, and who find it very difficult to believe that uh, they are lovable. As one young man said to me, he said, Peter, he said, why do you bother with the likes of us? Now you can hear the zero self-esteem in that question. Mm. Uh, so how do you come to bring young people to believe that they're lovable? Wasting your time talking to them about it. You got to show them love. You got to show them that they're lovable by the way in which you relate to them, by the way in which you treat them, by the way in which you listen to them, uh, by the way in which you respect them. You can only show people you can only show you can only bring people to believe they're lovable if they're experiencing love uh, i mean that's what happens to normal children growing up in normal homes they experience the love of their mother and they come to believe that they are of value uh, so we have to replace what these young people lost in childhood by showing them that uh, that they are lovable and that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't exclude challenging them hmm. and challenging their behavior. But as the thin line that you have to walk is to, you can, you can uh, challenge and re, uh, you can challenge their behavior and you can condemn their behavior without condemning the person. And that's a thin line that most of us find very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to walk. So yes, young person goes out and robs, I'll tell them, look, uh, you know, you're hurting somebody else. You're putting yourself at risk of going to jail. Maybe you shouldn't do that. But I'm not communicating that I'm rejecting him. I'm rejecting what that person is doing, but not rejecting the person. And it's that distinction, I think, that uh, you have to try and, and, and communicate. Uh, and we had a great social worker who, uh, used to say, you know, you'll, you'll, get, you'll change peop, young people far more by praising them for what they do than by condemning them for what they do. Mm. So whenever a young person, young homeless person, whenever they do something good, you know, to, to sh really shower them with praise and to say that was wonderful and, and that was terrific, uh, that's, that changes people far more than giving out to them.
mm. uh, for the rounds that they're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 to me, you you live such a self evidently good life, um, and I've seen other people that live self evidently good lives, but you also seem so happy. <laughs> uh, you seem like a happy person, uh, upbeat, which is you're a great demonstration of you could you can be a good person also be a happy person whereas a lot of time people think oh well i'll be one or the other you know it's kind of a, a dichotomy uh, is it am i is it true that you are happy are you do you wake up happy most days or, or do you find um life tough i'm, I'm the happiest person in the world <laughs> <laughs> no i'm i'm very happy i i feel that what i'm doing is very valuable it makes a difference to other people's lives I feel I'm helping other people to, uh, to, to live a more fulfilling life. And I am certainly in doing that, I find myself being fulfilled. So I've often said I get more, I've got more from homeless people than I've given to them. They have changed me in so many ways. They have challenged me. They've opened my eyes to, to, to uh, what's going on in Irish society. They've opened my eyes to uh, a false understanding of what the church is about opened my eyes to reading the gospel in a different way. Uh, I have received so much from homeless people uh, and I'm very grateful to them for that. So yeah, I, I'm very happy. I, I, you know, when you see a homeless person and you give them the keys of an apartment and uh, you tell them now walk in there, this is yours for the rest of your life. Mm. And you see the expression on their face and the smile on their face and the disbelief on their face that this is for them. That's the most wonderful uh, experience you can really have. Uh, so yeah, I have found my life very fulfilling. Uh, if I was starting off again, I would do exactly the same. I wouldn't want to change, wouldn't want to change anything. Mm. So yeah, I'm very happy. The, um, and being a priest, um, obviously makes what you do on one level possible you know um for starters about about poverty and um do you think being a priest has helped you be effective or or, or you know do you prefer people calling you peter or do you like them calling you father 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 peter well, they call me Peter, most people, yeah. or worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my nickname is Hedge. Hedge, how does that come from? We were uh, many in the, in the, when I was in the inner city back in the early days, we used to bring kids over to Liverpool. We had a minibus, we'd bring them over to Liverpool and we'd go to a football match. We'd spend the weekend in Liverpool. And there's a safari park outside Liverpool. So we drive around the safari park. And one day we were on the way out. And uh, I said to the uh, security man at the gate, I said, pointing back to a little 14 year old kid in the back, I said, with a cheeky little face, I said, we're taking one of your monkeys. And he immediately replied, we're taking one of your hedgehogs because my hair was spiky at that time. <laughs> So the nickname Hedgehog uh, stuck, uh, and then it was shortened to Hedge. So that's how that came about. And it became, I mean, I would get phone calls <laughs> from people saying, uh, can you give me the address of the Hedges? <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so you've been, you've been a hedge. victim of Dublin with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just shows you how cute, how smart these kids were with no education, but they could come up with that just like that. Uh, they could come up with uh, with something like that. So uh, what was it, what was I saying? Uh, yeah, I, I, I being a priest helped. It helped in the initial days, and it still helped. But initially, uh, back in the nineteen seventies, uh, being a priest meant you were trusted. Mm. So here was three three of us Jesuits. We were living in this very deprived area, uh, and the first thing the kids thought of was where we three guard thee trying to get information on what's going on in the area but once they realized we were priests we were trusted social workers have to earn their trust priests in those days didn't have to now they do of course after all the abuse and that but mm. in those days priests were trusted you could lose that trust very quickly but you started off with that trust and so it uh, it certainly it did make a difference yes um, and today it does make a difference. Uh, a lot of uh, 
a lot of homeless people ask me to baptize their children or occasionally ask me to marry them and certainly I do a lot of funerals. Uh, I, I think that's important and it's important for the, the life of homeless people as well that they can call on me to, uh, to, do, those, uh, to, to do those services. But my day-to-day -day life is unlike perhaps uh, most priests. Uh, I'm directly involved in, uh, in, in meeting and talking to and listening to homeless people. The um, do you, I, I, I very rarely see you with a collar on. Is that deliberate or do you find it easier to work without a collar? And declare uh, priesthood? One, I don't like a collar. <laughs> yeah. But two, a collar locks you into a label. It locks you into a, uh, into a role. And as I always say, I want to be known as Peter McVerry, who is a priest, hmm. rather than a priest who happens to be Peter McVerry. So, yeah, I don't want to be locked into a role, and that, that role today is certainly very negative. Hmm. So it would be, it would not, it not help me in my relationship with people, with homeless people, if I were going around wearing, wearing a collar. So I choose not to wear a collar. Hmm. Yeah, I do um, wear a collar at times, obviously, for, for funerals uh, and things like that. I do wear a collar. If I go to bless a child or a house or something like that, I will wear a collar. But uh, the vast majority of the time, I, I, I won't. Hmm. Uh, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, you would have thought, especially in the old days, when you said, you know, a priest had a certain, could, had a certain license, uh, could walk into areas and the trust was there. Um, and you could probably walk into, uh, you know, what might have been regarded as a tough area. And, you know, you mightn't be, I don't know, people would think it's a dangerous area. I wouldn't go in there. And I think that's an, one of the reasons why a lot of people actually don't see the poverty in, in, in the inner cities, because they don't go to those areas because they're, they're afraid of their own safety. Um, and that's, that's another reason why we stay in the bubbles, because we feel that if I go into that bubble, I'm putting my own life at risk. Um, what do you say? I mean, there could be, in other words, people that want to help, but don't are afraid to help. What do you say to that fear? I'm not sure that people are that afraid. Uh, perhaps some are, but I think it's just they have no they have no reason to go into that area. Why would they go in? There's nobody there they know. There's nothing there that they want. So you just don't go into the area. You don't meet people. Uh, you don't meet homeless people. Uh, unless you actually positively go out of your way to meet homeless people, you're not going to meet homeless people. You pass them on the street. Uh, but uh, So I think it's more, uh, it's more uh, by omission rather than uh, deliberately that people uh, don't engage with people from disadvantaged backgrounds. They just don't have any reason to, uh, to do so. So I think what we need to do is get people to make a commitment, right? I'm going to go out and talk to some homeless person or I'm going to uh, uh, go, into, go, into, go into an area. One of the things we used to do in the past when we had these retreats for justice, retreats for justice, and we'd get people in doing a retreat uh, and we'd ask them to go out in the morning to Grafton Street and to just look and listen and smell. <laughs> and then in the afternoon to go down to Sean McDermott Street or Summer Hill and just look and listen and smell. And the contrast, contrast was so stark uh, and something that perhaps they had never experienced before. And that raises all sorts of questions then for people about our society and about what's going on in this society. So I think we need to find reasons to ask people, look, make a commitment to do something like that so that our, uh, our, 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 our vision is expanded uh, so that we can see and, and feel uh, for people who are not in our own social, social group. Hmm. Because on your website, on your website, there's a there's a, a tab that says you know how to get involved. Um, I mean, do you find getting people volunteers is a challenge, or are you inundated with requests? Because I think a lot of people do feel they'd like to help, but they don't know how to help. Yeah, no, we're inundated with requests. Uh, okay. 
It, homelessness now is a big issue, and there's a lot of sympathy for homeless people, and the people realise that, you know, it's, it's not necessary in a society as, as wealthy as Ireland. So I think there is a lot of goodwill today towards homeless people, which perhaps uh, has changed. Uh, so people do want to get involved, uh, but obviously taking on volunteers does require a certain commitment from our own staff. You have to manage volunteers, you have to ensure that they're doing something useful, that they're having a good experience. Uh, uh, you do have to work with, you can't just take a volunteer and say, they're going to that hostel and work there. Hmm. No, you've got to work with them to ensure that their experience they're getting is, 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 is a good one. Yeah, we do get a lot of volunteers. What we also get is uh, we have transition year students and they spend a week or so in our drop-in centre. And what they're doing there is mostly just listening to homeless people and hearing the stories of homeless people. It has an extraordinary effect on them. Some of them have described it as a life-changing experience. Uh, others, many will say it's the most productive week of their uh, of their transition year so it and, and that reinforces my own experience it's in encountering people that uh, your 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 understanding and vision has changed uh, and your values and prejudices are challenged uh, so it's about uh, it's about Donald Dore has a wonderful book I've just launched and he talks about affective conversion which means we got to sort of, we got to think and not just think about issues, but feel about issues, feel for people who are in that situation. Until we begin to feel for people who are marginalized and for people who are excluded and people who feel undervalued, uh, until we begin to feel for them and begin to feel that their pain uh, impinges on us as well, then uh, that's the only effective conversion that uh, will bring about change. And that tends to happen. You have to have face-to-face -face real do. conversations, don't you? You're not going to have that effective conversion rarely by reading a book. No, you're not. I mean, reading a book, it, it can change some things, but no, uh, to have this commitment that, you know, we're going to do what we can to build a better world, uh, to have that commitment, you have to have a strong affective conversion. Yes, you've you've gone on the record, I think, once of saying, um, you know, my, my job is to become jobless or unemployed. By which you meant, you know, if if homelessness is solved and everyone is at home, then I'm at a job and I'm really I'm even more happy than I, you know. It, it, do you think you're any closer to that objective today than you were, you know, 10, 20 years ago? Uh, no, we're much, much, much further away from it. Uh, homelessness changes. Uh, it's, its nature changes. As I said, in the, those uh, 50s and 60s, it was tended to be a middle-aged man who had an alcohol problem. Then it became unaccompanied children. The issue we dealt with was 14, 15, 16-year-olds who were living on the street on their own. They had abandoned their families, often with good reason, usually with good reason. And they were living on the street on their own. And that was the issue. And the state didn't want to know. When we uh, approached them about funding a hostel, they said, we don't agree with this hostel. We don't see the point in this hostel. We're not going to fund this hostel. Uh, they, they didn't want to know. Uh, and they would say to me privately, look, once they get to 16, they'll end up in the St. Patrick's Institution, which was a detention center for, for 16 to 21 year olds. And so they'll be looked after them. Uh, so I brought a young man, 14 year old, uh, living on the street involved in prostitution to survive. I brought him to the health board uh, with a lot of publicity. <laughs> uh, and what did they offer him? They offered him one night in a bed and breakfast. That was their response to a 14 year old living on the street who was unable to survive. Uh, so they didn't, they didn't want to know. Now that has been taken care of by the Child Care Act of 1991. You won't find 14, 15 year olds living on the street anymore. They're, they're reasonably well looked after. It's not perfect, but they're reasonably well looked after. Then the problem shifted, and it shifted to young adults with a drug problem. Uh, and that became the dominant uh, homeless, homeless issue. Uh, and in more recent years, it's families who have become homeless. That's the most urgent issue now. You know, in 2014, there were no such thing as homeless families. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, five or six families a month might become homeless for various reasons, but they were very easily rehoused. Today, family homelessness is the big issue because it is so destructive. It is so destructive on the children. The children are suffering emotionally, psychologically, and educationally. And children are very resilient. Some of them will recover, but some of them won't. And some of those children who are today homeless are going to end up in our hostels. They're going to end up on drugs. They're going to leave school early. They want to end up in prison. So it's so destructive. Homelessness, particularly over a a period of months or even years uh, does so much damage. So the issue changes uh, regularly over the last uh, 40 years or so. And so where are we today? We're further away from solving this problem than ever before. We have new experience of family homelessness. Uh, uh, and we have a continuing drug problem. And the drug problem's got far worse. I mean, Gosh, uh, in, you know, today, today we would, today I would love if we only had a heroin problem, mm. but we have crack cocaine. Heroin puts you to sleep. Somebody who's on heroin, it's going to be no trouble to anybody else. <laughs> they're just going to fall asleep. They might wake up and they might overdose, but they're going to be no trouble to anybody else. Today we have drugs like crack cocaine, which can make people very aggressive and very violent. You have tablets extraordinarily difficult uh, to, to deal with because you can't just stop taking tablets uh, or you go into fits. Uh, you have the new drug like uh, liquid ecstasy or G, which is extraordinarily dangerous. <laughs> I mean, a drop or two more of liquid ecstasy and you're dead. Uh, drop or two more than you're used to and you're dead. And you can't stop taking it or you're dead because you have to stop taking it under medical supervision. So the drugs have become far more extensive uh, and far more difficult to deal with and far more difficult to address. Uh, that, uh, and, and that's just going to continue. It's going to continue. I see no end to this, uh, to this, to this drug, uh, to this drug uh, issue. It's, uh, it's affecting, it's affecting pe not just people who use drugs, it's affecting their families. People are running up debts, they're getting assaulted, their family home is being smashed up because they owe money to drug dealers. Uh, it's, it's, it's ravaging communities. Uh, so the, and that issue is, you know, it's, and the drug treatment services, what are available are excellent by and large, but there's so few of them available. There's many parts of the country, there's no drug treatment available. And even in parts where there are, there can be long waiting lists, three month waiting lists. Interestingly, during the pandemic, when the pandemic first hit, the three month waiting list was suddenly reduced to three days. <laughs> now, if we could do that when the pandemic hits, why couldn't we have done that before the pandemic hits? And why can't we do it after the pandemic is over? We need to have drug treatment services available for people who want it. Everybody, every single drug user I've ever worked with, comes to a point in their life where they want to give up drugs. They realize that the fun of taking drugs has disappeared and that these drugs now are destroying their lives and they want to give them up. And when they get to that point, you have about a six or eight win week window of helping them to get into treatment. And if they go on a three or four month waiting list, you lose that window and they begin to get demoralized, they begin to get despondent, uh, they begin to get depressed and feel they're never going to give it up. We need to rapidly expand drug treatment uh, uh, services in this country. I've always said that, you know, the, the drugs is a far more, uh, is a far greater threat to the security and stability of Irish society than the IRA ever were. These drugs are in every community, even in villages, and they are uh, destroying uh, family life and they're destroying community life. But unfortunately, that's happening mostly in poorer communities. <laughs> and so people who are living in better off communities don't see it, they don't read about it, they don't hear it. Because if you owe money to a drug dealer and they're coming and smashing your windows every second night, you don't go to the guards because you're afraid things will get worse. You don't go to the media because you're afraid things will get worse. So a lot of this is going on on an invisible uh, level that people are not aware of. But the drugs are destroying the fabric of this society.
And, and Peter, you know, when you paint that picture, which is, um, you know, pretty bleak and um, and like an organization like yours in that kind of context looks like, you know, you're like Canute against the waves. It's just it's, it's relentless. And now you're suggesting it's it's kind of got worse rather than better from a drug point of view. What, you can carry on being like Canute, but are you trying to make representations to the government or through agencies? And are you getting any any reaction or response? Uh, well, we do make representations to governments, uh, yes. Uh, what's the response? Depends, it actually it depends very much on the minister who's in charge. There was a very good minister uh, who was in charge. He came down to our detox center. He saw it, he loved it. He said, I want this you know, to be expanded around the country. And three months after he visited us, he was moved. <laughs> And a new minister comes in, and that's part of the problem. Uh, there's no continuity of decision making uh, at that level. Uh, but uh, and so I think there's also a prejudice against drug users, the belief that, well, look, you brought this on yourself. You chose to use drugs and you ended up in this mess. So it's your own fault. So why should we spend a lot of money trying to help you to get out of it? Uh, so there is that prejudice that exists among decision makers. Uh, which makes it hard to uh, to get the very substantial amounts of money that are necessary. Running a detox or a treatment center is very expensive because it's very uh, it's very labor intensive. You need counselors, you need people there who are working with those homeless or to the, with those drug users uh, to help them to uh, cope with their past childhood experiences and to help them to understand that there are alternative ways of coping without having to take drugs. That's very labor intensive, very expensive, and getting the money for that is a, is, is a huge challenge. Hmm. The, um, I mean, and that's, you know, it's remarkable that you have actually kept your spirits up. I mean, you've made it very, very clear that helping and working with homeless people has given, made your life so enriched. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering, how do you, um, how does Peter McQuarrie, how does he relax? Does he, do you have any hobbies? Do you, how do you, uh, how do you enjoy yourself or take a break? Relax? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Not in your vocabulary, no? I, uh, no, uh, I suppose I have a dog. That's wonderful. Uh, everybody should have a dog. <laughs> but it means that you have to look after the dog. You have to you know, when everything is getting on top of you, the dog just looks up at you and says, I want to walk. Yeah. You have to drop everything and you have to go for a walk. So having a dog, I think, is a great, uh, it gets you out of yourself and it gets you out of all your problems and it gets you out of all the issues you're addressing, at least for the half an hour that you, uh, that you walk the dog and tears the head. So that's, that's important to me. Uh, I'm also addicted to Sudoku. All right. <laughs> the puzzle that you, uh, you get. So I find that very uh, relaxing as well. Uh, I imagine you're advanced. You're an advanced player, are you? Uh, I don't do the easy ones anymore. No. <laughs> I do the more intermediate ones, perhaps. Uh, but uh, I enjoy doing that, and again, it gives you a sense of uh, achievement. Sense, you know, you get it, you get it done, like doing a crossword. But I'm no good at words. I'm much better at numbers. Uh, so it gives you that sense of <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Keep your mind ticking over. Keep yes. your mind from uh, from stagnating uh, and getting into a rut. So, do you um you know because you, you said you were you were a clever boy and um you know you did science. Do you um do you ever have longings to go back and you know follow that that kind of intellectual career or or can you still do that? I can't really. I don't have the time to do it. Uh, yeah, I was very interested in science. I still am very interested in science, but I don't get the opportunity to develop it. Uh, and I mean, it has developed. I think when I, when I was studying science back in the 1960s, I think they'd only just discovered the atom or something. <laughs> now, they, <laughs> now, it, now it has developed so far beyond that, that uh, unless you're really committed to, 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 to keeping up, uh, you, you lose touch with it very, very quickly. But I do, I look at it, I look at science articles now and again, and I, yeah, I'm, I, I'm still interested in science, yes. 
very good. When you actually, as an inter uh, you know, question I often, you know, uh, religious people that study science, I'm often wondering, did when you were doing science in UCD, did you ever sort of think, ah, oh, how do I, how do I square that circle? Uh, you know, the, the insights of science look like they conflict a lot of the time with the insights of religion. Did that ever occur to you, or, or did we no, have to quite, make sense? Quite of the it? opposite. Quite the opposite. Uh, you know, when you're studying the wonderful intricacies of science of the atom, say, for example. Uh, you're left or you're looking at the extraordinary expanse of the universe and what's happening in the universe. It just uh, reaffirms your wonder in a, a God who was able to, uh, to create all this. Uh, so no, it, it, it gave me that sense of uh, wonder, a sense of awe at, 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 at God uh, who was able to, uh, to, to produce all this. So no, it didn't conflict in any way. Uh, and the whole evolution thing, I, I just think uh, it, it reinforces my belief in God that, you know, the, again, I mentioned Donald Orr's book before, but in the Donald Orr's book, he talks about God as the mystery. And I think maybe we need to get away from using the word God, because the word God means so many things to so many different people. For some, it means the judgmental God. For others, it means a God who created the universe and has gone off and left it to its own devices. So a very impersonal God. It means different things to different people. Uh, and Donald Dorr says, maybe we should say, I believe in the mystery, the mystery, because we all can identify with that. Every child understands they live within a mystery when they ask their mother, mommy, where did I come from? And every adult who says, you know, what's the meaning of my life? They understand they're living within a mystery. So for me, I think we should begin the creed with, I believe in the mystery, the <laughs> mystery within which we all, uh, within which we all live. And that mystery, when I look at my own life, that mystery is extremely personal because it has led me on a very personal journey. Uh, <clears throat> so it's extremely personal <clears throat> and it's extremely loving because I have been given so much in life. I've been so blessed. Uh, so it's it's a mystery that is personal and loving. We can put the name God on it, but uh, as I say, we we often we use the word God to uh, to escape from the challenges uh, of life. Uh, so yeah, I I believe in the mystery, and well, studying uh, science re reaffirms that. It just reconfirms confirms you in your belief that we live within a mystery. Very good. Um, well, it's it's really been a real joy talking to you, Peter, and I'm I'm really you've been one of my heroes, pretty much for most of my life. Um, and uh, watching what you've done through your life is is so exemplary, and uh, you do it with such modesty. Um, you never look for praise, and yet so many people think you're wonderful. Um, but the way I'd like to end these uh, conversations is I kind of do it in a kind of um, a desert island disc. So I kind of ask my guests if uh, if they did find themselves on a desert island and now they can only pick uh, one book, uh, one piece of music and one luxury. Um, could okay. you share with us what you what you bring on that island? Well, I relax sometimes in the car. I, I, my preference is for listening to classical music to Beethoven, Mozart, and so forth. Uh, so I, I find that extremely relaxing uh, and extremely interesting. You know, it, it, you can enter into the music, you can enter into what the music is expressing. So uh, I would probably bring, uh, bring one of those, a book. I should it's say good. you have the Bible and you have Shakespeare. So take that as read. <laughs> Why Shakespeare? Well, you can have, oh, you can have Yeats. <laughs> we'll make an Irish version or James Joyce, uh, whatever you like. <laughs> what would I bring? There are a few books that have made uh, a difference in my life. Uh, one, I was, for a period, I was very uh, involved in Teilhard de Chardin. He was a Jesuit archaeologist, but also a mystic. Uh, so, and he wrote some terrific books. Uh, 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 one is the, the uh, le, le milieu de vin, the divine milieu, uh, which had a big influence on me in the early days. 
Another uh, author that may have a big influence on me was Tony DeMello, again, an Indian Jesuit mystic. Uh, and he produced a series of books which are absolutely wonderful and very stimulating. They consist of tiny short stories, maybe only 20 lines, but each story has just got so much in it to reflect on and to, uh, uh, to, to challenge you. So I'd probably bring uh, those two uh, those two authors with me. Yeah, yeah. And your luxury, or or, or are you going to forsake that? <laughs> <laughs> luxury, I don't know what. Uh, <laughs> your dog? Uh, oh, definitely, the dog will have to come. That's absolutely certain. But luxury, no, I don't have much in the. I remember in the early days when I went to Summerhill. I mean, I had some things that I valued and that I uh, was attached to, but I lost them all because they all got robbed. <laughs> so uh, I've learned to live with very little. I am very happy having very little. Uh, I don't need very little. I, I don't need very much. Uh, so luxury, just uh, no. As long as I have enough food to, to keep me going, don't even need too much of that. Uh, enough of the basics. You know, one of the things Tony DeMello would say that, uh, you know, our happiness consists in having everything you want. Now, you might think that's stupid. That's clearly not the case because millionaires can be very unhappy. But it's actually true. The problem is that the more we want, the more we have, the more we want. And so we're always constantly wanting more. And so we're always constantly unhappy. But uh, happiness, happiness, uh, unhappiness consists in the gap between what I have and what I want. And we're always, that gap is always there and often gets bigger no matter how much we have. But supposing what I, uh, what I want and what I need are the same thing. Suppose we reduce our wants. So when we reduce our wants to what is absolutely essential, then we can be happy because what we have is what we want. Uh, and I think that's my philosophy. I don't want very much. I'm very happy with what I have. As long as I have the basics, I'm very happy. Uh, and I, I basically don't want anything else. Very good. Well, there's a lesson on that. No, I, I'm also, I think you're the first guest that has ever not taken a luxury. There's something in that. <laughs> there's, there's a wisdom in that. So. Um, Peter, thank you very much again for uh, participating on this, on my series. It's It's been a real honor. And I wish you I, all the very best in the future, both for yourself as, as a person and as a priest, and also with the MacVerry Trust, which has done such, what may, may changed so many people's lives for the better and continues to do so. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. I, it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, and uh, as I say, the, the trust will continue. We've made sure of that. Uh, no matter what happens to me, the trust now will continue. That was an important part of, uh, of our development of the trust. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.